before I begin the message, I want to say happy Sabbath to you all and a happy new year. Uh, uh, in Australia, where I am now, is uh, today is the last day of 2022. Tomorrow, it will be 2023 in less than 24 hours. Uh, 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 so another year has passed and, and here we are welcoming a new year. We are a year closer to the coming of our Lord. Um, you know, a new year is, uh, is a good opportunity for a new start and uh, a new beginning. Uh, you know, the saying goes that if you always do what you have always done, then you will always be what you have always been. Uh, if you do not like where, uh, if you don't like where you were in life, where uh, uh, you find yourself in life in 2022. Uh, uh, if you don't like that direction, if you did not like the direction of your life, now is your opportunity to do something about it. Now is a good time and a good excuse to change. You know, many people uh, view a new year as a good opportunity to make a new start and, a, and, a, and, a take, and take a different direction in life. But the problem is they do not know how to do it. Uh, they think changing their address or, or, or their car or their career uh, uh, or their outward look will bring about the change they need. But what we all need to understand is that if you put the old man in a new car, you will still have the same experience. A new house does not make a new marriage. Uh, 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 I'm telling you that a new suit does not make a new man. A new career does not give you a new life. A change of life is the result of an inward change. What I'm telling you is that a new year does not mean a new start unless you have a new mind. A new life is the result of having a new mind and a new perspective of seeing your life. So don't think that because it is a new year, you will magically have a new start and a new life. If you will the way you thought, then you will continue behaving the way you behave. Because thinking brings about feelings and feelings bring about behavior. So if you want to change your behavior, you need to change your thinking. Your mind or your mindset needs to change. Don't let your history determine your destiny. Do not let what happened to you in 2022 determine what will happen to you in 2023. The mistake you made is in the past. The bad decision you took is in the past. With a new year comes the opportunity for a new start, the, the possibility to change, the opportunity to be transformed. Now is your opportunity to change. Now is your opportunity to start all over again. Today is the day of salvation, as the Bible says. Today is the day of change, and change begins in the mind. So utilize the opportunity you have before you make a new start. Stop wasting your time uh, worrying about what people think about you, what people say about you. It's not what they say about you that will bring a change in your life. It's not what they say about you that cripples you. It is what you say about yourself. It is, it is always what you think and say about yourself that cripples you or will fire you up. It's all in your mind. The victory is in your mind. <clears throat> I want to tell you that God has a dream. Uh, 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 uh. God has put a dream in your mind. He, he, he has put a vision and a purpose in your heart and mind. So do not let the opinion of others quench the fire that God has put within you. So happy new year, happy 2023. But if you really want to make it a happy one, if you really want it to be different than 2022, then ask God to help you change the way you think, change your perspective, change 
uh, 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 your way of seeing yourself and your life. So may God bless you and keep you and may 2023 be a, 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 a year that as it brings us closer to the coming of Jesus, it will bring you closer to the, to the purpose and the vision and the dream that God has for you. Amen. Now with this in mind, allow me to take this opportunity to give you a new perspective on why we worship God. Uh, I want us to examine a story in the Old Testament and draw some lessons out of it. Come with me to Judges chapter 17, beginning at verses 1 and 2. And the Bible says, And there was a man of Mount Ephraim whose name was Micah. And he said unto his mother, <clears throat> The 1100 shekels of silver that were taken from thee, about which thou cursedest and spakest of also in mine ears. Behold, the silver is with me. I took it. And his mother said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my son. The Bible tells us about a man by the name of Micah who lived in Mount uh, Ephraim. Micah stole 1,100 pieces of silver from his mother. Now, this was a large sum of money because later in the story, we read that 10 pieces of silver was a year's wage, right? When the money was stolen, the mother put a curse on it. Micah overheard his mother putting a curse. Uh, and as a result, fearing the curse, he returned the money to his mother. Micah, who later we read became a, uh, uh, so religious was a thief to begin with a superstitious fright made him return what his conscience did not forbid him to steal now in those days people took curses seriously and they believed that that when a curse is placed upon you it cannot be undone so the mother uh, 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 in order to try to patch up this curse she pronounced a blessing upon her son right now, she spoke the blessing in the name of the Lord, Jehovah. So Micah and his mother were worshippers of Jehovah. They believed in him and, and, and believed that he can bless people, right? The story goes on to say, And when he had restored the 1100 shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, I had wholly dedicated the silver unto the Lord from my hand for my son to make a graven image and a molten image. Now, therefore, I will restore it unto thee. Yet he restored the money unto his mother, and his mother took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to the founder, who made thereof a graven image and a molten image, and they were in the house of Micah. Micah's mom does not make a shrine so, so that she and her son can, can worship Baal or, or a dragon or, or any false god. The shrine was created to worship the Lord, to worship the one true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So they were going to worship the Lord of Abraham, Isaac, Isaac and Jacob, but they were going to worship him in their own way. They did so by copying the, the Canaanites and having an idol made. What a perfect illustration of the way the churches has gone today. We want to worship God, but we want to do it in our own way and on our own terms, right? The story goes on to say, and the man Micah had a house of gods and made an ephod and teraphim and consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. In those days, there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Micah must have had some spiritual inclination because we are told he had a, a temple or a house of gods, right? Also notice his name. It's a Hebrew name, which comes from the word Micaiah, which means who is like God. He is from Mount Ephraim, which gives us a clue to which tribe he belonged to, right? The tribe of Ephraim, one of uh, Joseph's sons. So this man is a Jew. His father and ancestors worshiped God. I, I, I would assume that uh, 
his own father must have been religiously inclined in, in, in some way because he gave his son a, a Hebrew name which had a significant meaning. And we saw that his mother was also spiritually uh, inclined as well. But the story tells us that Micah mingled his Jewish religion with the pagan religion of the day. He made for himself an ephod, which is one of the articles found in God's sanctuary. And, and, uh, uh, and it was worn by the high priest, right? Not only that, but he appointed one of his sons to be the priest uh, in the temple that he made. For whatever reason, we're not told, but Micah must have decided not to go to Jerusalem and worship the God in the temple anymore, right? He decided to make a temple for himself in his own house, which is convenient for him. And, and, and he made, he bought or he made his own gods. We know that one of them costed 200 uh, uh, shekels of silver to make, right? Just a side note in here. Uh, children imitate their parents. The mother made one image. The son had a house full of images and the grandson became the priest in the house of images. If we once leave the spiritual worship of God, there is no telling how far one uh, uh, should wonder. There is no telling how far our family will we'll wonder the next generation and the generation after that. You see, at that day in Mount Ephraim, the going style of worship was worshiping idols. Uh, 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 this was the culture he was living in. It, it was in fashion to worship idols. He was seeking comfort, convenience, and a way of, uh, uh, to adopt his preconceived ideas, his culture and his fashion into his religion. He wanted to honor the God of his fathers. He wanted to do that which was right, but he wanted to do it in his own way. He wanted at the same time to, 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 to honor his culture, to, to honor the God of this world. He wanted to do what was right, but he wanted at the same time to hold on to the fashionable things of Mount Ephraim. Now, notice the Bible says, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. It wasn't that people were trying to do the wrong thing. That's important to, to, to understand. Nobody wanted to do the wrong thing. Everybody wanted to do the right thing. They were trying to do that which was right. Right? That's what the Bible says. The problem is that they were trying to do what was right in their own eyes, not in God's eyes. It is a big problem when people set their own standard of right and wrong. When, when, when they try to do what is right without having the right person living in them, without having the right motive. Uh, 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 we, we, we live in a culture well, the world has taken it upon themselves to determine what is right and what's wrong, what's good and what's bad, uh, 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 what's a, what, what, what a man is and what a woman is. You, you know, there was a, a, a time when it's easy to determine what a woman is. Not anymore. Not anymore. The world has changed the definition of so many things. They have changed the definition of what is right and what is wrong. Right? That's what the world uh, 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 has done and just like at the days of Micah we live in a time when everyone is trying to do that which is politically right but it is right in their own eyes what about you and me today are we doing what Micah did are we mixing a bit of Christianity and a bit of our culture and the world are we seeking our comfort convenience and and fashion first or are we seeking God now, there is nothing wrong with wanting to be comfortable, with, with wanting the conveniences and, and even the fashions of, of the day. There's nothing wrong with that. The question is, who is more important? What, what, what is more important in your priority list? Who takes a preeminence in your life? God or the things of the world? Only you can tell. 
The story goes on to say, and there was a young man out of Bethlehem, Judah, of the family of Judah, who was a Levite, and he sojourned there. Now, an, another interesting man comes on the scene. It's interesting that his name is not mentioned. He is identified by his tribe. We're told of the family uh, uh, of Judah, who is a Levite. He belonged to two tribes, right? Now, if it only says of the family of Judah, we know which tribe he belonged to. We would know where he lived and, 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 and so forth, right? When you think of Judah, you think of a particular tribe and a particular inheritance. But when you hear the word Levite, you don't think of a particular inheritance. You don't think of land. You don't think of, 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 of uh, farms and so forth. You think of holiness. You think of priesthood. You think of God, the one who chose the tribe of Levite, who dedicated the tribe of Levite for his service, right? Let's keep reading. Verse 8, we read, And the man departed out of the city from Bethlehem, Judah, to sojourn where he could find a place. And he came to mind Ephraim to the house of Micah as he journeyed. Notice that this Levite was wandering, looking for a place to stay. The reason I point that out is, is that Levites were supposed to be serving in their priestly role in the tabernacle and then later in the temple. This begs the question of why a Levite was wandering around looking for a place to stay, a place to make it and call it home, instead of being in the temple and, 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 and going about God's business, whether in Jerusalem or out of Jerusalem, right? And again, our answer is found in the verse we read earlier in verse 5, where it says, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. In other words, nobody was worshiping in the temple. Everyone was, was going about doing his own wish, his own will in his own way, right? Just like Micah was. This, of course, meant that uh, many Levites were sort of out of business, uh, 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 if you will. And as such, they were forced to abandon their priestly calling and look for a job. This Levite must have had enough of where he was. He thought to himself he was not making it in life. So he decided to go out and find uh, uh, for himself a new place to live, to make, to forge a new life for himself. He was looking for a change. He was looking for, for something that will satisfy him, that will meet his needs. He was a Levite looking for a city to dwell in. Now, notice the Bible is specific about what this Levite was seeking. It says he was looking where he could find a place. He did not travel to evangelize. He, he did not uh, go out seeking someone to win to God. He did not go out on a holy mission type of thing. He was looking for a place to stay. You and I are called a, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, right? Uh, uh, you and I are made kings and priests unto God. What are we using our time here on earth for? Are we looking for a place to dwell? Are we looking for an earthly city and earthly inheritance? Have we, like this Levite, forgotten our calling? What filled your mind in 2022? In this past year, what filled your mind? What occupied most of your time and most of your life and most of your thinking capacity and your creative capacity? What occupied that? We're about to enter into 2023. You owe it to yourself to examine the life you lived this past year and ask yourself the question, do I want to continue on the same path do I need to change my direction, my priority, my thinking? What would God want me to do? You owe it to yourself to pause at least now at the end of this year and the beginning of the next year. 
man, you owe it to yourself to pause and think, contemplate on this past year. Has it been going the way you want it to go? And most importantly, has it been going the way God wants it to go? If not, time to make a change. And as I said earlier, change begins in your mind, in the way you think, right? See God for help in that aspect. All right. Now, as, as going back to the story, as, as this uh, uh, Levite was traveling, uh, he comes along. Uh, across Micah and and we read in verse 9 and Micah said unto him whence comest thou and he said unto him I'm a Levite of Bethlehem Judah and I go to sojourn where I may find a place Micah meets this man and asks him where are you from who are you and the man says I am a Levite from Judah and I'm traveling looking for a place I am looking for something. Interesting. This man is proud to be a Levite. He used his God-given position as a resume, as the means to find a place. I am a Levite. That's his resume, right? The story goes on to say, And Micah said unto him, Dwell with me, and be unto me a father and a priest. And I will give thee ten shekels of silver by the year and a suit of apparel and thy victual. So the Levite went in and the Levite was content to dwell within, uh, sorry, with the man. And the young man was unto him as one of his sons. When Micah found out that this man was a Levite, he made him an offer that the Levite could not resist. The priest could not resist it. He offered him 10 shekels and a shirt. And the Bible tells us that the Levite went in. And then it says that the Levite was content to dwell with the man. The Bible, the one who recorded the story, uh, is making a point in here. At the foot of Mount Sinai, when Moses gave uh, the call to see who is on the Lord's side, the Levites made their stand with God against the idol, against idol worshippers, against the system of worshipping anything other than God, right? Against the system of worshipping idols. But now this Levite was content. He was happy to dwell with the man. He was content. He was happy to take this new job and minister in the house of gods, in the house of idols that Micah had. This Levite used God as the means to get the job. His God-given position, his relationship with God as a priest, as a servant of God, he used that for his own personal benefit. I'm a Levite. What my name is, is not important. All what's important to you to know is that I'm a Levite. I can serve you in spiritual aspects type of thing. That's his resume, right? This Levite used God as the means to make his life more comfortable, to obtain wealth and happiness, to, 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 to advance in his earthly life. I'm repeating it because I want you to, to get the point, to understand it. God was the means by which this Levite got this job. Interesting. Instead of allowing God to use him for the kingdom, this Levite used God for his own personal benefit. Let's keep reading. Verse 12 and 13. And Micah consecrated the Levite, and the young man became his priest, and was in the house of Micah. Then said Micah, now know I that the Lord will do me good, seeing I have a Levite to my priest. I mean, I'm not like everybody else. I don't just have a priest. I have a Levite as a priest. You know what that means? That means the Lord will do me good. Question, or rather a few questions. Why did Micah hire the Levite? So the Lord can do him good. So what was Micah really after? 
Was he really after serving God? No, not really. Was Micah after helping the Levite? No, not really. <clears throat> Micah was after the good or the blessing that he will receive from God. Micah was ready to do anything and everything in his power in order to receive a blessing. If it comes from the Lord, great. If it comes from any other God, well, I've got plenty of them in my house of idols, right? So Micah hired the Levite thinking that by doing so he will please god who in turn will do him good micah viewed god as the mean to receive good things serving god and pleasing god was only done in order to obtain good to obtain a blessing Are you with me micah was more interested in the things god has than in God himself. Micah was more interested in the blessings that come from God than in God himself. Now the story goes on to tell us that the tribe of Dan came and offered the Levite a better deal, right? In the next chapter, chapter 18, we read, and they said unto him, that's a tribe of Dan, they said unto him, hold thy peace, lay thy hand upon thy mouth, shut your mouth, man, and go with us. And be to us a father and a priest. Is it better for thee to be a priest unto the house of one man? Or that thou be a priest into a tribe and a family in Israel? And the priest's heart was glad. And he took the ephod and the teraphim and the graven image and went in the midst of of the people. I mean, the guy was not going to leave his God behind, right? He thought about his God, so he took his God with him and the, 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 the teraphim and, and the, the ephod. What a story. What a character, right? Now, how can we apply this to our day? What lesson can we learn from it? Do, do, do the principles of this story still happen in our day? Are we in any way, shape, or form guilty of it i believe that it is important for each and every one of us uh, uh whether here or or will listen to this sermon especially as we enter into a new year as we finish a year and begin a new year hopefully with a new beginning and a new start i believe it's important for each and every one of us to ask ourselves the question is god a means or is he the end. Is God the means to obtain something? Or is God the end? Is he the destination? Right? Why do I, why do you worship God? Why did I accept him in my life? Why do I serve him? Now keep this story of the Levite and Micah in your mind. And I want to take you, bring you forward from the days of, of Micah to the 21st century, to our day today. Notice what this minister from the uniting church of, of Christ, and possibly I doubt he is no longer a member of the uniting church, right? But I want you to notice what he came to believe and teach. He authored a book titled The Possibility of Christian Humanism. The possibility of Christian humanism. In the introduction to his website, notice what he says. Belief in a God has become difficult for people today, but many of these same people also find it difficult to walk away from Christianity. So we ask ourselves whether it is possible to be a Christian without believing in God. And the answer I came to for myself is that being a non-theistic, meaning someone who does not believe in God, being a non-theistic Christian is not only possible, it is necessary for those of us who find the life and teachings of Jesus attractive and compelling as a God for life, but who have difficulty with the concept of God as understood in traditional Christian theology, right? He goes on to write, the various articles on this website and in my book, The Possibility of Christian Humanism, 
make the case for a form of Christianity that does not involve a belief in God. A non-theistic, non-religious form of Christianity that we call Christian humanism. Christian humanism. This man has come to the point where he believes that he does not need God in order to live a Christ-like life. He believes that he figured out or he discovered what the real purpose of religion is. What exactly does he mean? How could I not believe in or worship God, yet use the life and teachings of Jesus as a guide for my life? What would Christianity without a belief in God, Christianity without Christ, what would it look like? Well, I'll let him tell you what this Christianity without God look like. <clears throat> he goes on to say, we have now come full circle on this issue of whether it is possible to be a Christian without a concept of God. And if so, what would that Christianity, sorry, what that Christianity would look like? We affirm again our premise that being a Christian does not require a simultaneous belief in gods or theological propositions in magic or superstition. And that the test for determining whether or not one is a Christian is a simple one. Anyone who claims to be a follower of Jesus should be seen standing with the weak against the powerful and the rich, feeding the hungry, comforting the sick, bandaging the wounded, holding the hand of a child, standing with the oppressed against the oppressor. It means hum humility rather than arrogance and pride. It means becoming fully human. So according to this man, being a Christian means being a person who brings happiness to man. It means standing with the weak, feeding the hungry, comforting the sick, and so on. The essence of Christianity, the heart of Christianity, according to this minister, is the happiness of man. This is Christian humanism. It is mixing Christianity with humanistic the theology or philosophy, right? Christian humanism is the belief that everything revolves around the happiness of man. Humanism is a philosophical statement that declares that the end of all being is the happiness of man. A humanist believes that the reason for existence is man's happiness. God is not important. God does not exist. That's what a humanist think right now what does a christian humanist has to do with micah and the levite what do they have in common well micah and the levite used god as the means to obtain happiness wealth blessings and good god to them was simply the means to get happiness their ultimate goal in the story we read was their own personal benefit, right? The Levite was interested in the 10 shekels and a shirt, and Micah was interested in the blessing that will come from the Lord as a result of having a Levite for a priest, priest right? He was interested in the blessing. Their pursuit in life was their own happiness. It was all about what would I get out of it? Their service to God, their relationship to God was motivated by selfish reasons. Their ultimate goal and pursuit were their own happiness. While in the 21st century, a Christian humanist has taken the system of thought to its logical conclusion and came up with the belief that the end of all being is the happiness of man. Why bother with a God who will control your behavior, who will make you feel guilty when you do something wrong, who will tell you what to do and what not to do? Why bother with him? Just get rid of him <clears throat> and publicly confess that the ultimate purpose of life is the happiness of man, right? So what is in common between Micah, the Levite, and the Christian humans? It is this. 
the principle or pervading thought that ruled and still rules their life is humanism, which is the end of all thing, is the happiness of man, the end of all things, rather, is the happiness of man. So we see this humanistic thinking extending from the days of Micah to our day. The question is, have I, have you been affected by it? Has Christianity been affected by this humanistic thinking, by the motto of the end of all things is the happiness of man? Well, we all in here can say, well, you know what? Praise God, I'm not like Micah and I'm not like the Levite. You know, we don't worship idols and, and, and so forth. And we say, we're not even like this Christian humanist. We believe in God. Well, praise God for that, you know. But the question I would like to put to you is this. Why do you worship God? Why do you come to church? Why do you do the good things that you do? Why do you obey God? What has been... <clears throat> the driving motive that moved you to serve God this past year. Don't tell me just some philosophical idea that you heard somewhere that you like, that makes you sound good. You examine yourself, examine this past year and, and, and think of your motives. What moved you to serve God this past year? And you know what? Most Christians have blessings and salvation in mind when doing all these things that we do for God, right? We believe in God. We obey God and we worship God for a reason. Our reason is to receive a blessing or to be saved. You know, salvation is a blessing, right? <clears throat> the ultimate goal of Christianity in many Christians' minds is salvation and, and the heavenly inheritance we will receive, the streets of gold and the crown of life and so forth, right? And if salvation and the heavenly inheritance is the ultimate, is the ultimate, the most important goal, then your hunt in your Christian experience will always and only be what must I do to be saved? You will help the needy because you think you will gain a blessing out of it. You, you, you will come to, uh, 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 to, to, to a camp meeting because you think you will gain a blessing out of it. You will keep the Sabbath because you believe there is a blessing in keeping the Sabbath. Your drive in serving God will be obtaining blessings and salvation. <clears throat> we say it is good to keep the Sabbath because there is a blessing in it. It is good to obey God because there is a blessing in obedience. Well, what if there was no blessing in keeping the Sabbath? Would you still keep it? What if there was no blessing in obeying God? Would you still obey him? Do we serve God because of who he is and what he has already done? Or do we serve him because of what he has promised to give us and to do? Think about it. What is your focus on? What is the desire of your heart? <clears throat> is it God or the things that God has? And if the motive you have for serving God, if the, the motive that has been in this past year in your heart for serving God is obtain, obtaining blessings, then haven't you been affected by humanism? even unintentionally? Isn't your own happiness, your own um, benefit, the ultimate goal of your Christian experience? Aren't you serving God to obtain something out of him? If the reason I marry my wife is that so she can serve me. If, if the reason I befriend you, I become a friend with you, is that, so I can get something out of it. What would uh, this say about our relationship? Uh, what would you say about my relationship with you? Would you be wrong in concluding that I'm, I'm only interested in my wife or in you as a friend uh, uh, because of the things that I will benefit? Wouldn't this mean that I value 
what you have more than you? Look, there is nothing wrong with coming uh, uh, to God and accepting him in our lives because we want to be saved, because we want to escape damnation. That is normal. That is natural. And you know what? In the scriptures, God, many times he dangles the carrot of salvation and forgiveness of sin and, and so forth in front of us to bring us to him. It is his love that brings us to him, right? And, and all these things, all these blessings that he gives us, that he tells us in the scriptures are a manifestation of his love. So if we come to God as a result of wanting to escape damnation, as a result of wanting to be saved and wanting to be forgiven and wanting to be blessed, there's nothing wrong with that. God accepts us and he welcomes us in his family and, and, his, and his kingdom, even though our motive has been self-preservation. Are you with me? There is nothing wrong with that. But we need to move out of that and get to the place where like Paul, we can say the love of God controls us. Are you with me? There is nothing wrong with starting, with beginning our journey with God uh, uh, out of a motivation for self-preservation, a motivation for receiving a blessing. There's nothing wrong with starting our journey that way. <clears throat> but we cannot finish our journey in the same way we started. Selfishness, brothers and sisters, is the root of all evil. And the humanistic thinking is founded in selfishness. I believe that it's very important for each one of us to ask ourselves the question, is God a means to obtain a blessing, to obtain salvation, to obtain happiness and so forth? Or is he an end? Is God a means to obtain an internal inheritance? Is he the means to obtain a, a blessing or is he the blessing itself? Now, <clears throat> don't get me wrong. God has your salvation and eternal inheritance in mind. It is very important for him. The scripture is, is filled with, with the good news of what we have in God and what God has prepared for us, right? I mean, Jesus told the disciples, I go to prepare a place for you right? He wanted them to think of the place he's, he's going to uh, 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 prepare for them. But what we need to understand is all these blessings are the byproduct, not the prime product. The ultimate purpose of Christian, uh, Christianity is serving God because he is worthy, not because we can gain a blessing out of him. Your happiness and salvation are a byproduct of your relationship with God. They are not the prime product. You know what? The Christian humanist who doesn't believe in God says the end of religion is to make man happy while he's alive here on earth. And the traditional Christian, the one who believes in God and has been tainted by humanism, says the end of religion is to make man happy after he dies. Are you with me? The Christian humanist and the traditional Christian, the one who believes in God, sorry, the one who does not believe in God and the one who believes in God but has been tainted by humanism, they both think that the end and the purpose of all religion is the happiness of man. The only difference is the Christian humanist who does not believe in God tells you the purpose of religion is to make man happy right now. While we're alive, the traditional Christian tells you the end of all religion and the end of all spirituality is to make you happy in the afterlife. Humanism, I believe, has crept into uh, uh, our religion and it is rarely seen. It has become a part of a, Christ a Christian walk and the an attitude and mindset. And we don't even know it. And here we find Micah, he wants to have a little chapel and he wants to have a priest and he wants to have prayer and he wants to have devotion because I know that the Lord will do me good. This is selfishness and it stinks in the eyes of God. 
And the Levite comes along and he falls right in with it because he wants a place. He wants 10 shekels and a shirt and some food. And so in order that he can have what he wants and Micah can have what he wants, they sell out God for 10 shekels and a shirt. And this is the betrayal in, of the ages and it is the betrayal in which we live in today. Humanism has crept into our religion and we don't even know it. Most Christians have sold God for a blessing or for a mansion in heaven. We have considered God as the means to obtain blessings here on earth and salvation in the life after. And guess what happens when the blessing does not come? We start doubting God. We, 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 why am I serving you, God, if, if you're not going to bless me? I mean, why in the world did I join the church if I'm still going to have the heartache that I had before? If, I, if I'm still going to have the bad luck that I had before, right? If you're not going to make my life comfortable, why am I serving you? You promised me. You know, Jesus said that they might have life. I have come that they might have life and they die that they might have it more abundantly. And we assume this means that God will shower us with all the blessings and we're going to have a comfortable life and life full of roses and, and no headache. And, and when all that doesn't happen, we start wondering why in the world we're we serving God. God simply became the means to an end, the means to obtain happiness for men. Humanism has turned God into nothing more than a slave to man. God rules in heaven to make man happy. Jesus came to earth, lived and died to make man happy. The whole universe and the one who created the universe exists for one single purpose, to make you and me, to make humanity happy. That's what humanism has done with Christianity. If all what you serve God for is to obtain a blessing and to have a better and more peaceful life, if all what you repented for is to escape hell and enter into heaven, then you are not any better than Micah and the Levite. If you began like that, it's okay, but don't stay there, man. Move on. So why should we serve God? Why should we worship God? We are to worship God for the same reasons all creatures in heaven worship him. I realize I'm running out of time, so I'm going to speed up a bit. Notice these couple of verses and from Revelation uh, uh, chapter 4. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the, th uh, before the throne saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created. In chapter 5 we read, And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beast and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them Heard I saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb, that's Jesus Christ, forever and ever. They, the angels and all the creation in the planet that, that well, and the redeemed in the future, right? They worship and will worship God and his son because they understand, because they are convicted that God is worthy of worship they, they they are not forced to worship him they are not simply worshiping him because there is a law that says worship him or because god says if you don't worship me i'm going to kick you out of heaven Be, if you worship me i'll give you a blessing no they worshiped god because they knew god was worthy of worship worship praise Blessings, glory, and honor is ascribed to God and to his son because they are worthy of it. Because the lamb 
redeem them to God by his blood because of what God and what the Lamb has done. In other words, worship is the natural outflow of of understanding and knowing God. It is the natural outflow of having an experience with God. True worship is motivated by an experience you have with God. It stems from a heart that is convicted and convinced of God's worthiness. What I'm saying to you is nothing new. This is, this is the way we live our life. This is the way we, we, we operate and we practice Every day, uh, readers praise their favorite authors. Uh, 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 lovers praise their loved ones. Parents uh, uh, praise their children when they're good, right? Uh, 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 um, and sometimes people praise their politicians. It used to be in the past, not anymore, right? Their favorite politician. Now, why? Because praise completes the enjoyment of whatever it is that you like. We go to a restaurant, we enjoy a meal, and then the first person we, we see, we tell them all about this meal. Why? Because, you know, uh, praising what we enjoyed is like the icing on the cake, right? Praising what we enjoy is, is part and process of enjoying it. Now, let us apply this to worship. If we truly understand what God has done for us, and not only understand it, but experience it in our heart and in our spirit. You cannot help but praise God. You cannot help but worship him. Why? Because you would have come to the place where you realize that God is worthy of praise and worship because of who he is and what he has done, not only because of what he will do. You with me? And what you will receive as a result of worshiping. You are not worshiping God because you're obliged to or because you want to get something out of him or because you're wanting to escape the punishment, right? We are to praise and worship God because we have tasted and we have seen that God is good and is worthy of worship because you have experienced him and know that he's worthy of it because you have an enjoyable experience with him and praising him completes the process of enjoyment. Are you with me? Why do you worship God? Is it because he's worthy or because you can get something out of it? Allow me to close by sharing a, a, a story, a true story. I've shared it in the past years ago, but I'll share it again. Uh, 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 this story, the the the, the the, the principle that comes out of this story changes, ought rather to change our perspective and, and the reason why we worship. You know, a story goes uh, on uh, of, of two Moravians. They heard of an island in the West Indies where an atheist British owner had two to 3,000 slaves, which he had bought with his own money and brought them to that island to, to till the ground, to work it, and he said, no preacher, no clergyman is allowed on the island. If he's shipwrecked, you put him in a house, you lock him up. I don't want to hear any more of this, this nonsense gospel. I want nothing to do with God. I don't want any of my slaves to be infected with this uh, uh, type of message, right? So he took them to the, uh, 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 to the West Indies and, and on an island there, and they locked up to live all their life and die without hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Two young Moravians heard about this news. So they sold themselves as slaves to this British planter and used the money they received to buy tickets to go there, right? Because that's the only way to enter into that island as a slave. Now, <clears throat> They were standing on the boat and all their family had, had uh, 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 come down from Hernhut, I believe the name of the village. They came down to, to, to the wharf to see their loved ones leaving, right? And as the, as the ship began to, to, to leave and you had the two, these two Moravians standing on, on the ship on the handrail saying goodbye to their loved ones and, and their loved ones crying and saying goodbye to them. And as the wide starting, uh, the, the, the gap starting to widen, the two Moravians hand in hand, one of them, 
lifted the hands up and he said, he yelled out, may the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. May the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. This became the call of the Moravians for the rest of, of their life and their mission trip. And this is the only reason for being, the only reason for worshiping God. It is so the, law, the lamb that was slain received the reward of his suffering. And this story, my dear brother and sister, it reversed it all. It righted it all. Why should a person come to the cross? Why should a person worship God? Why should a person uh, 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 serve Christ? I'll tell you why. Because God is worthy of it. Because it is the only way that God can get glory out of man. It is the only way that you can give glory to God. So have you reached the place where the love of God is controlling you? Have you reached a place where your motive of serving God, the fuel that is driving you to worship God, to serve God, to obey God and to live for God is your knowledge and your experience, your personal experience with him that tells you that he is worthy? You know, as I said before, I say again, we are finishing 2022 and entering into 2023. Whatever your motive was for serving God in the past, that is in the past. If it was because God is worthy, keep going with it. God bless you. But if it wasn't, now is a perfect opportunity to change. Now is a perfect opportunity to get that personal experience with God, to taste and see for yourself that God is good and that knowledge moves you to serve and worship him, knowing that he is worthy. You know, uh, Albert Einstein said, if people are good only because they fear punishment and hope for reward, then we are a sorry lot indeed. There has to be a greater purpose in your walk with God there has to be a greater motive in your heart that leads you to serve God other than escaping punishment and obtaining rewards. We need to get to the place where we know God. We experience God. We know the heart of God, where, where God's heart has touched our hearts in a way that it controls our lives, where we say with Paul, the love of God constrains us. Amen. God bless you all. I'll leave it at that and we'll close with a word of prayer. Loving Father, we thank you, Lord, with all our hearts for saving us, for redeeming us. We thank you for sending your son to, to live and die and rise from the dead to give us eternal life. Father, what you have done for us is uh, almost unbelievable. I pray, Lord, that you'll give each and every one of us an experience with you. So what you have done in the past will touch us in a way that will control all our future. I pray, Lord, that your past actions will control our future actions, Lord. I pray that you will uh, uh, help us all to understand and to know that you are worthy of worship, of glory, and honor, you are worthy of us sacrificing, giving our lives to you. We love you, Lord. I pray for a blessing upon all your people as we enter this new year, Lord, 2023. May it be a year where we all draw closer to you, where we have a stronger and a greater experience with you as we draw closer to the coming of our Lord Jesus. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.